Folks, welcome to church. My name is Nathan Dannis, and I'm one of the pastors here in the historic First Congregational Church of Kalamazoo, Michigan. We're a member church in the United Church of Christ where we say no matter who you are and no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, and we mean it. I want to encourage uh, the members of our church, if you haven't done so already, to please download the Breeze app at the App Store. 
Uh, it is our new church directory. It's a way to stay plugged into activities of the church, both online and in person, as we prepare to have some upcoming in-person worship activities. As always, if you have any challenges with that, just shoot us an email, info at kazoofcc.org. That's kazoo, like the musical instrument, F as in first, cc, congregational church, dot org. No matter where you are, no matter what's going on in your life, if you need peace, if you need joy, let's take a moment, allow ourselves to be grounded, and allow the peace of God to enter into our hearts. Beloveds, I say, may the peace of Christ be with you. Happy Sunday, everyone. My name is Kim Patry. Won't you please join me in the call to worship? As God's love has lifted us, let us sing songs of hope. As God's mercy has framed our lives, let us give thanks for God's unchanging love. Praise God for the healing power that is offered to each one of us.
friends, we are a congregation that is dedicated to the way of Jesus Christ. And in everything that we do, we try to model his faith, his behavior, his teachings. And so to that end, we are also a public uh, sanctuary church. We provide sanctuary for Auntie uh, Sahida Nadim, who has lived with us for two years now on our campus. And every Sunday, we pray a special prayer together. It's the prayer of sanctuary. It's for Sahida, but it is also for all those who are hurting who need hope, and who need protection. And so I invite you now to please pray our prayer of sanctuary with me. God, eternal refuge, we humbly ask that you protect your precious daughter, Sahida Nadim, in her time of struggle. Protect her from those who seek to do her harm. Give her strength and courage during the day and rest and peace during the night. Strengthen the spirit of all your children in the community of Kalamazoo. Make them one people for the sake of the poor, the wanderer, the immigrant, and all those seeking refuge in this difficult day. Amen. Good morning. This is Pastor Sarah with a message for the kids. In our scripture this morning, Jesus tells a story, but the story is in response to a question. Someone asks Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive someone? And then Jesus tells this story. Do you ever have to forgive people in your family? Have you ever had to ask for forgiveness? I want you to listen to this story. It's a story about somebody who was forgiven and then was asked to forgive someone else. There's a connection between those two things. And I wonder if you will notice what the connection is. Are you ready for our blessing this morning? Dear God, thank you for loving and forgiving us. Help us love and forgive others. Amen. I hope that you have a really wonderful week. Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. I'm reading from the Inclusive Bible, so it may look different from what you have in front of you. Peter came up and asked Jesus, When a sister or brother wrongs me, how many times must I forgive? Seven times? No, Jesus replied, not seven times. I tell you, seventy times seven. And here's why. The kingdom of heaven is like a ruler who decided to settle accounts with the royal officials. When the audit was begun, one was brought in who owed tens of millions of dollars. As the debtor had no way of paying, the ruler ordered this official to be sold, along with family and property, in payment of the debt. At this, the official bowed down in homage and said, I beg you, your highness, be patient with me and I will pay you back in full. Moved with pity, the ruler let the official go and wrote off the debt. Then that same official went out and met a colleague who owed the official $20. The official seized and throttled this debtor with the demand, Pay back what you owe me. The debtor dropped to the ground and began to plead, Just give me time and I will pay you back in full. But the official would hear none of it, and instead, had the colleague put in debtor's prison until the money was paid. 
When the other officials saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and went to the ruler reporting the entire incident. The ruler sent for the official and said, You worthless wretch! I canceled your entire debt when you pleaded with me. Should you not have dealt mercifully with your colleague as I dealt with you? Then in anger, the ruler handed the official over to be tortured until the debt had been paid in full. My Abba in heaven will treat you exactly the same way unless you truly forgive your sisters and brothers from your hearts. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Kinfolk, happy Sunday. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, glorious, merciful, and forgiving, open the eyes of our hearts and renew our vision for you. Amen. Well, I have never seen more preachers flee from a lectionary text this week, uh, I think, than ever before in my entire career. Uh, make sure you go back and really read the text today. It is a hard one. It is a hard teaching. Everywhere that I look, every single preacher I've seen uh, is, is, is posting or tweeting or whatever, saying, you know, first, God, help me figure out a way to preach uh, this honestly this week. Or second, uh, they say, is, um, how big of a deal is it if we just go completely off lectionary? Uh, it's funny to me, I always preach lectionary because it keeps me um, it keeps me on track, it keeps me from wandering, keeps me rooted in Jesus, which is where I, I want to be. But sometimes a, a given teaching from Jesus cuts so directly against the grain of the world and present uh, uh, circumstances, it's almost as if God intended it that way. Uh, it's almost as if in reading our Gospels, when Jesus' teachings cuts against the grain of the world, that it seems as though God intended it that way. That's why I love the lectionary. So I laugh in these conditions because I feel, again, as though I'm being humiliated by God. Humiliated by God. Think about that. Uh, God is, after all, the only person I'd want to humble myself before. So this is a good text. It's worthy of study this week. And a lot of us are disgusted. That's because a lot of us are disgusted by what's going on. Uh, some of the things that we've seen on TV or on the internet this week, uh, perhaps we have some disgust with our fellow human beings. I'm not going to crawl down into the gutter, uh, but it, it's everywhere. It's all around us. And most especially, I think that a lot of us are very angry these days at people in positions of power and authority globally nationally, locally. We want to see justice, right? Or at least some modicum of acknowledgement that this stuff ain't normal. But it doesn't seem to happen. Nobody ever seems to get punished for behaving reprehensibly. And it makes us feel like we're taking crazy pills. Didn't people used to get punished uh, uh, for committing high crimes and misdemeanors? No. I mean, it depends on who you ask, I guess. I've, uh, I've seen it posted quite frequently. I've seen a lot of popular stuff. I saw a bumper sticker recently that said, things aren't getting worse. They're getting filmed. Uh, one of my favorite American uh, thinkers and authors and human beings is uh, Duncan Trussell. And he recently wrote a quote, um, some poor phoneless fool is probably sitting next to a waterfall somewhere totally unaware of how angry and scared he's supposed to be. That's a lot of it, I think, just consumption. But Peter goes to Jesus about this feeling of anger and disgust and, and desire for, um, for justice, maybe. And in the context of the reading, I'm trying to figure out what, what is Peter so angry about that he's asking this question about forgiveness it just starts right out. Jesus, how many times am I supposed to forgive somebody? Well, this is coming on the heels of some pretty heavy stuff. This is just after Jesus has revealed to his disciples that he's going to be put to death uh, by the state. It comes after Jesus exempts his disciples from paying the temple tax 
And he tells them that only people like children are going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And finally, we've got this business that we talked about last week, about things being bound on earth and in heaven and how to offer correction to one another. This is heavy stuff. So I think Peter is probably thinking, I always think of Peter as thinking, what on earth have I gotten myself involved in? But I think that Peter's thinking, as I would be thinking, this is just, um, this, is, this is about more than fulfilling the law. Uh, this is a radically different way of, of thinking about and living in relationship with other people. So it's natural for him, I think, to worry about his human impulses, his fiery te- temper, and, and his ability to hold a grudge. How, how long can you hold a grudge, Kindred? You better know the answer to that. Uh, I know for myself. I am capable of holding on to a grudge for approximately 24 to 48 hours, I think. That's about, that's about my emotional half-life. And uh, now some of you out there, I know you. you. You are actually completely unfamiliar with the feeling of having a grudge. I see you, you angelic, uh, funny angels out there. (laughs) I admire you. Now, some of you will hold on to your grudges like they're coffin nails. Uh, I can stay angry at somebody for about a day. Then I just kind of want to just not talk about it again. I've been told that this is because of my zodiac sign. Uh, Also, it's because of my Enneagram number. Uh, just all sorts of different stuff. But I think it comes from growing up with siblings. I think that that's what it was about. Uh, roughly every 24 hours, your siblings would do something worthy of a grudge. And, and you just can't, you can't live that way. You got to move on because when you grew up like I did out in the country, at some point it's going to be time to go ride bikes and catch frogs and shoot BB guns. And you can't do that if you're angry at your siblings all the time. You have nobody to play with. But I know that not everyone is this way. Find out what your emotional half-life is. Figure out how long you hold on to a grudge. That, that's important information for you to know about yourself. I'm not saying it's better to be one way than the other, okay? I'm just saying that it's good data to have about yourself. Anyway, I, I wanted to weasel my way out of Jesus' teachings today because this was a hard one for me. So I, I did some contextual research. I drilled down into Peter's use of the word forgiveness. Right? Forgiveness. What, when he asked Jesus, how many times must I forgive? What's he actually asking? What does that word forgive mean? So I thought maybe the Greek means something totally different than the English. Now the English word forgive, it's an interesting word. And I, it's, you should study it, look it up. It comes from Old English. Um, it's not a complicated word. Um, forgive um, um, comes from the, the, the four part the first part of the word for, it means completely, completely. Uh, And give means to to give. Uh, So it's sort of what it says, to completely give, to completely and without reservation give. Uh, It used to be used in the context of marriage, right? Um, To completely give without any reservations. In other words, when this word was used in Old English, it would mean something like a contract. This is now yours, whatever this is, and I now want nothing more from you. There's no strings attached. There's no more debts to be paid or anything like that. It's a, it's a, it's a sort of word of finality. That's the English word, forgive. The Greek word uh, that the Gospels uh, give us, it's a translation of whatever the Aramaic word was that Peter used. It's different. It's a little different. I think that the, the better translation for the Greek would be closer to the words um, to leave alone, uh, or to, to let alone, or ignore, or maybe permit. I think permit's a good word, a better word. L- 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 in other words, another way to think about this is, Lord, how many times must I permit a brother or sister to sin against me? Do you see the difference there? There is a difference a little bit, I think. Um, and the word in the Greek can also mean to send away. To send away. How many times must I send away my brother or sister who's sinning again? Well, this isn't good news. I mean, this is kind of doormat talk, right? I don't like, I don't like where this sermon is going at all. 
Um, but I hear in, in this comparison of language, the English and the Greek, and understanding in the, in the English something, in the English word, there's something transactional that we expect to take place, right? When we forgive some, somebody, it's a, it's a transaction. It's a paying of a debt. Uh, you do something hurtful to me, I go to you and say, I forgive you, and nothing more of you is required. Okay, now we're going to talk about that uh, in, a, in a minute. But in the second sense, in the Greek sense, it's, it's more like, I feel like, um, an absence of mind. Uh, uh, this is kind of a Zen thing. Uh, um, a refusal to engage with some sort of emotional state. And it makes sense if you read the parable uh, that Jesus follows this up with to illustrate it. There's a king, right, who summons in some servant who owes him, you know, millions of dollars. And this dude can't pay. And the king says, all right, well, it says here in the uh, book, I got I to gotta sell you and your family into slavery. <laughs> and the guy's like, whoa, wait, wait, Pl- please don't. Let me go. I'll, I'll try to find a way. And the king, it says, moved with pity. This is the same emotion that Jesus felt when he fed uh, the, the, the 5,000. The king moved with pity. He lets him go. He cancels all his debts. Right? That's just a total, just like a, a going away, a, 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 an absence of mind, perhaps. Now that king, right, he's out millions of bucks. But he's a king, right? So maybe he's okay with that. I don't know. But this same guy, the same forgiven guy, he goes out into the world and he finds some other poor uh, schmuck who owes him five bucks and a sandwich and he has that guy thrown into jail. The same dude that just had his millions of dollars of debt forgiven. And the king hears about this lack of compassion and things go really badly for the first guy. Um, And Jesus says basically this is how it is with God. God has forgiven you more than... God has forgiven you more than you can possibly ever repay God. The way I, I, I read this, though, is typically through the lens of blessing. And for those of you who come from a more conservative background or who are um, perhaps escaping some toxic theology, I recommend this way of reading it to you, reading it through a lens of blessing. For example, um, it's, it's, it's evening time after dinner, and I'm laying back in my big chair, in Daddy's chair, uh, with my two-year-old son and my four-year-old daughter on my lap, and they both look up at me with these lovely little faces, and I think to God in that moment, if I had all the money in the world, I could never repay you for this one single moment of joy. And you, God, you filled my life with them. And what's more, what's more, you've taken away my fear of death. So how could I even repay you, God, for even a fraction of what I owe? And I hear, I hear God say, no worries, no worries. And then I go out into the world the very next day, perhaps, knowing all of this, and would I shake someone else down for the money that they owe me? When I've been given so much? Wow, that's bad business sense, Nathan. How do you ever expect to get rich that way? No, I promise you that I am richer than you will ever know. That's another sermon. But I think that what Jesus wants for his disciples, honestly, if we're going to read this text straightforward and in context, and it may be distressing to read it this way, but I think that this is what he intends for them, is to release his disciples, to release them from the bondage of believing that they are owed something by other people. Now, um, why would he do this? You know? It's not fair. It's certainly not justice. You know, what, look, look at the rulers and the elites uh, and the military occupation that's going on in the days of Jesus. What do those elites demand from the Judeans? Okay, what? Respect. Temple taxes. Shine their boots. Honor their authority. And Jesus, I think, wants to release his disciples from playing their silly games. But he knows that 
that in the disciples, they would love to do the same thing amongst themselves. Jesus wants to give them a way out, a third way through this practice of forgiveness. Okay, I want to I close um, with a few thoughts about forgiveness in practice in the English sense of the word. First of all, I believe very strongly that it is never appropriate to offer forgiveness to somebody for an offense that they caused to someone else. I think that's important. I think it's something that we get wrong frequently. It's not our place to do that. Um, I was once, uh, in a previous life, part of an accountability and healing circle uh, in the state of Tennessee for a a man, uh, a minister, who had created this um, kind of fake ministry uh, program that attempted to fix gay and lesbian kids um, by submitting them to something um, that's called conversion therapy. And conversion therapy is now illegal uh, in many states and jurisdictions in almost every country in Europe. Um, it's, it's, it's conversion therapy is the absolute opposite of therapy. It's a kind of psychological terrorism uh, where you take a gay kid and then you try to force them to switch their sexual orientation. It is a nightmare. And, uh, and, and, and eventually, after enough time went on, this man was finally confronted with the facts on the ground, right? which is that this sort of thing um, has led to the deaths of hundreds of children, uh, to suicide, homelessness. He finally came to Jesus, and he shut down his program. But at one point he said, I feel like, he was, this was him attempting to, I think, repent. He said, I feel like a bus driver who was driving a bus full of kids, and we got into a terrible accident. You know, and I had to be the one to say, no, no. No, that's, that's not what this was. This wasn't an accident. You all on your own accord chose to drive that bus off the, off the mountainside. Uh, and you charged their parents money uh, for the opportunity. And he cried and cried and he asked if I would forgive him. But the thing is this, I'm not the one. I'm not the one who needed to forgive him. It was the parents of all of those children that he abused and the children himself who had survived his abuse. Now, I wrote the, I I did pen the ethics complaint that got his therapist license revoked. Um, I like to think at the end that he perhaps came to some kind of understanding about the harm that he'd done. It's not our place to apologize on on behalf of other people. And there's an important word uh, that we're missing in our English language today, and it frustrates me. Um, that I have to teach it to people so often when they find themselves in these positions because it's a first step kind of word, and that word is contrition. Contrition. Uh, it's the, it's, it's the, it's, it is the act of being contrite. That is, uh, that you, you are possessed of a feeling of genuine remorse. Uh, you are penitent. And we try, and we know how to do this with, well, we think we know how to do this with little kids because we try to make little kids be contrite all the time. We say, tell them you're sorry for hitting them. And they say, I'm sorry. And then we say, no, say it like you mean it. And they go, I'm sorry. And this is, that's not, that's not contrition. Uh, we, we shouldn't do that with kids. We should work on empathy because contrition comes from empathy. It comes from compassion, uh, the ability to empathize with the other person's situation. Uh, when the harm that you have caused actually begins to cause you pain yourself. Contrition is the first step in restorative justice. It's the first step in getting right with other people or a community of people. And it's most often, I find in, in, in my work, it's most often the thing that's missing when we go on this journey of forgiveness and restoration. Uh, how many times have you heard someone Uh, Some famous person who was caught being a jackass uh, issues some lame apology, and then you think to yourself, well, you're not sorry. I mean, you're just sorry you got caught, right? That's that's what our current culture is about. There's no contrition. Um, It's unfortunate. I think that today, oftentimes, contrition 
uh, is, is legally ill-advised uh, because admitting any sort of sense of fault or responsibility can create uh, you know, litigious legal liabilities on down the road. I, I recognize that this is often the case. Uh, but it's a sick trap that we've set up for ourselves in our current culture. And we've got this idea, uh, I think there's still this idea out there that if the ref didn't see it, uh, it isn't against the rules. Um, but folks, uh, the ref sees everything. The ref sees everything. When we're the victim... When we're the victim of an attack or some abuse, I think that today's message for us from Jesus is that Jesus wants us to have encouragement and the emotional strength to be able to get through life without the burden of carrying a grudge. I don't think that this is about simply ignoring uh, attacks on us or our persons or our community or our family or whatever. I think it's more that Jesus doesn't want us to have to carry that, that weight. Um, there's a quote uh, that's out there that is frequently and falsely attributed to the Buddha. Uh, this quote actually has its roots in the 12-step community. Um, but I like the way that Ray, uh, writer Anne Lamott uh, puts it best. She writes, quote, Holding on to resentment is like eating rat poison and waiting for the rat to die. End quote. It just doesn't work that way. I know it doesn't. I think in, out of all of this today, what Jesus wants for us, for each of us, is to stop eating the rat poison. Now, he, he knows all about the injustices of the world. He knows all about the crooked leaders and the corrupted politicians and the villainous little schemers and fascists and racists and rats of all sizes and shapes. Good God, if anybody knows about him, Jesus does. He knows about crooked cops. For the love of God, they threw dice at his feet while he was dying. He knows about crooked cops that plant evidence and conspire to arrest and kill innocent people. Believe me, he knows about this, all of this stuff. We don't need to tell Jesus anything. But here's the thing. He also knows all about you. And he wants you to be unburdened and healthy and well and blessed. And I think today he's worried about his disciples, about the rage that they may carry in their hearts. We do have work to do out there. We've do, we do have good fruit to produce, uh, Christians. It's the works of justice and righteousness. There's a hard road to hoe out there in the world, and it's going to take some measure of righteous anger uh, and soul force and spiritual power and uh, nonviolent direct action and resistance. Um, ignore it and it will go away. It has never once in the history of humankind ever worked. Uh, we do have things that we have to do together, but we can't go into that fray or whatever with bellies full of poison, just ho hoping it will somehow hurt the people that are hurting us. It just doesn't work that way. Um, what I want for myself this week, I think, is the ability to forgive not seven times, but 77 times. To release myself from grudges, resentment, anger, frustration, and stop giving space in my brain, rent-free, to all of the powers and principalities that want to hurt me or destroy me or slander me or whatever. Rather, do the actual work of forgiveness, which looks like love and restorative justice in action, but by going into the world and finding the contrite person seeking my forgiveness. And when I find contrition in my own heart, seeking out the person who I must receive forgiveness from and taking part in the practice of restorative justice to, to restore right relationship, to, to, to reconcile one another. And above all else, remembering all that God has given me in my life, free of cost or expectation. And the greatest of these gifts is his Son, Jesus Christ, who is my Savior and who has taken away the bitter sting of death. That's an economy of love, I think, that is going to work for everybody.
Well, I mean, maybe not everybody. It's not very good if you want to, you know, make a billion dollars. But I think that if your heart is where your treasure is and your treasure is where your heart is, it'll work for you. At least, I think, for us disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please join with me as we pray together the prayer for our church. Gracious God, in these moments, you have called us away from the world to a place and time where we can commune with you and with one another. Calm our anxious spirits that we may hear your word, that we may receive grace to bring out a deeper, better understanding of what faith can be. Open us to the reality of your all-embracing love, both here and in the wider world. Set us apart to extend and model the grace you have shown us by offering grace to others. And by our words and actions, may we help to bring about your realm here on earth. We pray in the name of the one who died so that we might fully live. Now join with me as we pray as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Kinfolk, your giving sustains a powerful witness here in the city of Kalamazoo and uh, throughout our nation. Through your giving, we're able to support various charitable uh, efforts and organizations as well as accomplish miracles here on the ground. This past week, it looked like repairing a vehicle so that somebody could get to work. Uh, it looked like covering an admission fee for a daycare program. It looked like a night's stay in a hotel for victims of a house fire. It takes many different shapes and forms and sizes, and sometimes it's big efforts and small efforts, but it all happens through your giving. Please visit fccgiving.org and give generously to sustain the work of this historic church here in Kalamazoo. Friends, it's Quarry here at Remember on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Thank you for the opportunity to give you an update today on some of our work and a special thanks to First Congregational Church for your continued and generous support of Remember's work here on Pine Ridge as we build things and build relationships with the Oglala Lakota people of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. A special note of thanks to Diane Roberts for your continued and generous support of Remember as a board member for many years. Diane, we're so very grateful for your commitment to the organization. Thank you. This has been a year unlike any other in Remember's 20 plus year history here on the reservation. And it really began back in March as our first group of volunteers this year had just arrived when COVID began to sweep across the country. The tribe has implemented a number of safety measures to limit the exposure of the reservation. and. Fortunately, even as the numbers continue to climb across South Dakota, they've remained relatively manageable here on the reservation. With our dedicated staff and with your support from afar, we have continued to provide services across the res. And this year, we've already built about 90 beds for children and elders who needed a bed of their own to sleep in. Bill's been busy in the shop with Trevor and Travis building those beds this year. Will and Michelle have completed 22 outhouses and installed those for homes that lack functional plumbing, giving a dignified solution to folks who needed a place to use the restroom. We've built about 15 sets of decks and steps, giving safe entry and egress to homes across the res. And we've built four wheelchair ramps for disabled individuals to safely access their homes as well. To this point, we have completed two skirting jobs and that can insulate around the bottom of a trailer home, sometimes lowering the winter heating costs by 40 or 50 or even 60%. And this morning's 35 degree low temperature reminded us that winter is just around the corner. In fact, 
we'll soon begin our winter heating season down at the wood pile as we cut, split, and deliver firewood to homes in need. A normal winter will do upwards of 400 deliveries. We'll also be assisting with emergency utility payments, keeping homes connected to the electric grid and putting propane in tanks to keep homes warm. But before we get to winter, the harvest season is almost upon us and Devorah and our friends at South Dakota State University Extension have a beautiful garden planted at Feather 2. The harvest will soon begin and we're excited to uh, show you our progress in the high tunnels and the gardens as we welcome you back, hopefully in 2021, uh, for another Remember season. This year has been uh, a, a true challenge and thanks to the generosity of our friends from afar, we've been able to keep all of our Lakota staff on the payroll, Kim in the office, Nyla in the kitchen. She's been busy creating Unchi's Kitchen Fry Bread Mix and uh, making us uh, quilled jewelry to sell on our online store. And that's one of the ways that you can be part of Remember even from home, from afar. If you visit our website, www.re-memberr, Dot org, you'll find a link to our online store and that's where we've been purchasing and selling items from our artisans and crafters across Pine Ridge. Folks that depend on tourists and volunteers from across the country and around the world who normally would be here to buy their uh, creations and support them with, with some income. Without uh, all of you here this year, we've been able to set up that store and offer an opportunity for folks to buy things uh, and support those artisans from home. You can also, when you're on our website, sign up for our year-end celebration. This year we're going virtual, so join us from the comfort of your couch for an update on all that has happened this year here on the Res and a look to the future as we prepare to welcome you back to Pine Ridge. We'll be hosting that virtual gathering on Indigenous Peoples Day weekend, or Columbus Day, as some people still refer to it. So uh, please check out our website. You'll learn more about the ways that you can support Remember from afar. And uh, as always, we look forward to welcoming you back to Pine Ridge soon and are so very grateful for your support. Thank you to everyone at First Congregational Church. Thank you to uh, all who have continued to send your support from afar. We miss you, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks so much. Human beings created in the image of God, all of you, and all of them, Let's remember that. This week, let's be humans seeing humans, creatures seeing creatures, releasing ourselves from hanging on to any resentment or grudges so that with an open heart, we can go out there and seek justice together. Go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord your God. Amen.